Amen. Well, good morning, church. Glad you guys are here. Man, this is a great group. I love the 1130. It's got its own vibe, doesn't it? This is a little late service. Y'all are just kind of kicking it in. Either you're thinking about lunch or you just had brunch and you're happy. Either way, you know. And we're going to put something in you, the Word of God that never goes away. But before we do that, I want to announce to you something big coming up next week. I want Pastor Neil to come up. And as you know, God has blessed us at Highland Park. We've been growing incredibly and it's almost as if we're pregnant. And so what do pregnant women love to do? Give birth. That's what we're going to do. As a church to Lakeland Family Church. And about a year ago, Pastor Neil came to me and said that he wanted to uh, go ahead and quit as the kid's pastor. And I was like, this isn't making me sad. No, he didn't want to make me sad. He just wanted to get a job so that he could help fund a new church. And I was like, well, we want to start a new church. He goes, well, I want to do it here. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And so uh, the board uh, has agreed to send him out and for anyone that would want to go th to be a missionary to a different part of Lakeland, I want Neil to explain kind of the logic behind this decision that we believe is God's will. Um, yeah, about a, about a year ago, um, Pastor Brett and I had been talking just about, well, the whole time I worked here about planting churches. And um, so about a year ago, Lakeland Family Church was birthed inside me. And, and uh, like he said, the steps to take in, to dive into that took place. And um, so Lakeland Family Church, we picked that name because having been involved in youth ministry and children's ministry for so long, we saw the importance of family ministry and what that looked like and what it could be. And so we, we wanted to test that out and say, okay, well, what would it look like if there was a church that was family centric, that was, that was partnering with families, partner with single moms or single dads or, you know, regular families or whatever families look like nowadays. Mm -hmm. And how could we impact the community that that church existed in through the family? And so, we believe that when you have healthy moms and dads and they're growing in Christ, you have healthy kids and then they're growing in Christ. And when they're growing as a family unit, we believe that is the greatest way to impact the community. Um, so that's the, the heart behind our church and behind Lakeland Family Church. And so we begin to pray about well, where is that going to take place? Because there are a lot of great church plants taking place in Lakeland right now. And you might think, well, why does Lakeland need one more church? Um, even if everyone in Lakeland that's not currently attending a church or does not call himself a believer attended every single church in Lakeland, there would still be, uh, there would still be a need for churches. It's, out, out, it's staggering the number of people in Lakeland that do not call themselves a Christian or do not call a church home their home. And so we thought, okay, where's a pocket in Lakeland that is real and that is true and that is growing? And, and God took us out towards the airport. Um, if you go down Pipkin Road, there's growth that's taking place out on the west side of that. And so we begin to look for where, where would that take place? And there's an elementary school there called R. Bruce Wagner on Yates Road. And so God made that our home. It's been a, quite a process to get in there and to, to, you know, to take over, I guess you could say. But um, God's allowed that to take place. And um, we're going to start meeting actually two weeks from now on October 14th will be what we consider our soft launch. Um, we're going to start meeting and figuring out how to set everything up and just all of what that entails. And so, but we have a meeting next Sunday, October 7th, in the kids' room, in my old room, the factory, at 4.30, if you want more information. You might be sitting here thinking, well, yeah, that's not for me. This is my church home. Well, this was our church home as well. I and mean, we had to leave our life group and we had to, we had to leave our kids and not my kids. <laughs> Sometimes I want to, but... Not my, but by our kids in the kids' ministry, and just we, we had to step out in faith. Um, and sometimes when God's kind of nudging you, it can be uncomfortable, um, it can be inconvenient. Um, but we have already begun to see the fruits of that faith and that step in our own family, in the family of some of the, the lives of those that are coming with us and their kids. You know, we've got sixth graders, fifth graders stepping up and going, I want to serve, I want to do something. Amen. Amen. And, um, and so we're just excited about it, but we need a lot of help. Um, we have a small team of believers that are together and that said, okay, we, we want to be an adventurer as well, but we still have, if you asked me, where do you need help? Yeah, <laughs> everywhere. And, and so there's a place for you. If you yeah. say, okay, I want to be an adventurer. I want to reach out because Brett believes that this is not supposed to be a pool. This is not just a pool. Highland Park does not just exist to be Highland Park. Amen. Um, it exists to be a kingdom minded church. And so when, when that happens, it becomes a river and, and things flow out of that. And so Amen. we're just a result of the amazing um, leadership that's going on here and the amazing church that you guys are. So 
we would love for you to come check us out. Hear, hear more of what, what we're about, more where you can be involved. Next week. Next week. Tell them when. 4.30 in the kids' room next week, next Sunday. All right. Let's pray for Neil. Father, we thank you for Neil's faith and for Jennifer and the boys that they want to go and support what Dad is doing, but there are already others that you're calling to join them in this church that are sitting on the sidelines, they're not doing a lot, and they're feeling their heartbeat, and they're going, man, should we do this? But I pray that you would give the people in the seats and online the faith to take this next step, to try something new, to birth something that will be around in 60 years, that can bless the next generations with the good news in this different area of the city, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Yeah, so it's my prayer. I've been praying for the last eight months that 100 people in our church, 100 adults would say, we're going with Neil. And so if you go, you won't hurt my feelings, you'll be an answer to my prayers and to the prayers of our church body because we want a strong and healthy church in that neck of the woods. You know, 15 minutes drive is, is a big obstacle in some people's mind. And you think, well, they can come here and get the same thing and just have to drive. I'm telling you, it's new churches reach new people. Amen? And so we're going to give it a shot and let God do what he can do. And uh, hopefully many of you will step into that. So take out your notes. I want to tell you that today we're going to talk about how God loves us. This is the end of a series, How Love Behaves. I'm going to get really encouraging for, the, for you. If you came with your head down or your tail dragging, you're in the right place because God's word has a lot for us to hear. And we've been in a particularly weird week when it comes to news. Politics has dominated the news, the Supreme Court confirmation hearings and all that goes with it, and people are angry on both sides of the aisle as they have been for the last 20 years, it seems, and politics has is, is just denigrated into, it's just disintegrated into something that it wasn't ever, and democracy's at stake, and all of those things are true about out there, and, and what, what, what we know is that we don't know what's true about what anybody says, about any subject other than what God says in his word. And so on Sunday mornings, we get to come together and make this one declaration that regardless of what political party you belong to or who you believe in life, we as Christian people make this one declaration, Jesus is Lord over all, amen? Can we just agree on that fact? And, and, and we're going to talk about little things that, that, that bother us and really three plagues that I, that I call the plagues of the modern mind and why I need this daily dose of love from God. And the first plague I was thinking about is stress. Stress affects every person of every age. Stress is too much to do, not enough time to do it, or too much to do with not enough resources to do it. Right? You know what you need to do, but you don't know how it's going to get done. I was just thinking, you can be old and young. My daughter Hope brought home homework. She's brought home homework, homework never, every, nearly every week. And uh, like one and two hours a night, she's sitting at the table. And I was thinking, what in the world, man? When I was in school, I had homework once a month, maybe. I mean, because the teacher always said, now do your work at your desk. I don't know what's going on now. Did we not do that? Did we forget about that? Or are we just putting so much out there that kids have to do it at school and do it at home? Anyway, I don't know. I'm not taking shots at teachers. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering out loud, you know, just like how in the world are these kids so overworked? It is stressful to be a ninth grader. Can I get an Amen. Amen, all right, I see, amen, all right. Yeah, Colton's still hanging back there, yeah, okay. <laughs> but this week, the politicians have made it hard on us, right? The drama that, that, that is stressful. We have concerns about the future for our children, for our environment. As parents, we're thinking, what in the world is the world going to be like? There's a lot of stress. Many of you feel that, the stress of needing to measure up to be something that your mom or dad said you would never be. There's a lot of stress. So stress is one of the plagues. The second one is anxiety. It's an outgrowth of stress. Anxiety is when you've had so much stress for so long, it becomes a way of life that you can't see any good outcome of getting out of bed. You can't see any good outcome of going to work. And, and when you lay down, it's hard to sleep because of the anxiety, the tension, the chest pain, the, the, the panic that sets in. And it's everywhere. 
Obviously, you know, the, the uh, doctors, uh, the, the research has been done that anxiety medication is literally flying off the shelves in a record pace that more and more people are choosing to medicate anxiety. And not, I'm not against anxiety medication. It's just out there. It's everywhere. And people don't know how to deal with it. And right now, maybe would be a good time to just let God's love sink in there. And, and, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a minute. The third plague is loneliness. Anxiety, stress, and loneliness are epidemic. Even in our crowded world where we're really connected electronically, people in greater numbers feel all alone where families are being elevated, and rightly so. We want people to get in families. Sometimes people that feel left out don't know where they fit. And so to find somebody becomes the pursuit. And, you know, I mean, it, it is hard to find somebody if you're, if you're wanting to have a spouse one day and you're thinking, How do I, where do I do this? And so I was just uh, watching a special on modern dating apps like Tinder and OkCupid and there's a bunch more and I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands if you've been on these apps. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Tinder for instance is an app, an application on your phone which allows you to view all the people in your certain whatever pond you want to pick from. Dark hair, light hair, you can just name all the variables that you want and you want to see pictures of these people that have put their pictures in the system. In their system, pictures come up, and if you like them, you apparently you just swipe right. I've never done this. That's what I'm told. Swipe right means you, that's like a like. Now, if they swipe right when they see your picture, then that's a match. And apparently, this is a very addictive process. They said it's almost like a slot machine. It doesn't pay off when you swipe right on every picture. But the fact that it doesn't pay off every time actually makes it more addictive by nature. And I was like, wow. He, they said the developers didn't know one of the unintended consequences of Tinder, a dating app. Now, again, it's good for people to get together. So here's what happened. For men, well, let's start with women. Women, when they get on Tinder, 80% of women get on Tinder for a relationship. Whereas men, when they get on Tinder, it's 80% prefer to have a sexual encounter that day. That's what it is. So, so just so you know, and some of you do not download it because I preached about it, because it's not. It, it could be the devil in disguise, okay? But if you've had it, if, if you've been tempted, because it is a very addictive thing, because loneliness is the epidemic. And ladies, I have three girls by nature are more relational than guys who are apparently not so bright and just want a short-term fix. And they talked about how some guys even have so many apps going at once. They've got a Tinder girlfriend. They've got a Match.com girlfriend. They've got all these other girlfriends. They're just hookup apps for the guys. And it's just sad. But it's where we found ourselves as a culture when we don't know how to relate one-on-one -on -one or in face-to-face. In, in -face. It, it's digital. It's all now. It's all about how do I cure this what's wrong with my heart, which is I feel so lonely. I need something to fill it, and, and it's not working out real well. So let me give you some hope. Because the world is broken because of stress, anxiety, and loneliness. It always has been. The Apostle Paul once wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome. It's called the Book of Romans or the Epistle of Romans, but it's really just a letter. He was writing to a group of people that he'd never met yet. He was going to be there, but he wanted to explain to them the basics of the Christian faith and what the Christian life was about and what we expect from God in the future. And he, so he talks about the brokenness in the world, and he says it this way. I didn't put it in your notes. It's on the screen. He said, of all creation, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. You say, what happened there? What was God's curse about? Well, when Adam and Eve, when they first sinned, it instigated this major universal shift in all of creation. It broke, it shattered creation, of which now we get to be part of that broken creation but it says with eager hope the creation looks forward to the day when 
it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. We're looking forward to that, all of us. For we know that all creation has been groaning as if the, in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Like, if you notice that all of the species, they say 99% of the species of animals that ever existed and plants are now extinct. It's kind of like as if creation is groaning, it, it's decaying, it's dying, but all of creation is looking forward. And it says, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit with us, in us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our rights, our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I want my 21-year-old one back right now. We were given this hope when we were saved. So I just kind of read to you this, this, this passage that Paul is saying things are broken. They've, they've been broken since the first sin. But all of creation is, is longing for this day when God will redeem our current creation. He'll, he'll take this planet and make it new, and he'll give us new bodies, those of us who follow him. But now he's going to get a little more personal. Look at verse 26. Now, these are in your notes. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Would you pause and pray with me for a moment? Father, in this beautiful passage, you're beginning to describe, to describe to us your love for us, how you love us every day, and Lord, in this room, there are people that are filled with stress, anxiety, and loneliness. Would you speak to their hearts today and remind them of how much they are valued by you and how much of a good future you have for them? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So look at your notes. The four ways that God loves me every day. Number one, God is constantly working for me and you behind the scenes. God is always up to something. Isn't that good news? Yeah. All right, so I need an amen corner. Anybody want me ready? Say one, two, three, amen. One, two, three. Amen. All right, you got it in you. All right, yeah. Kind of gets me loose. When you say amen, it's like give me a little back massage. Let me give me a little, get, yeah. hit him again, pastor. All right, amen. All right, there we go. So it's, he's constantly working behind the scenes. So here, here's what it says. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. The Spirit is always at work helping us. Now, I have weak areas, you have weak areas, that sometimes when we fall into them, our weaknesses, they hurt us. So where we hurt ourselves, the Spirit helps us. Like weak areas are like sadness. I mean, sadness is a part of life, but when you step into the puddle of sadness, sometimes it can stick you like mud on the bottom of your shoe like you can't get out of sadness and it, it, it kind of sucks you deeper sometimes and the spirit helps me when I'm feeling sad sometimes my weakness is sweets <laughs> like the spirit the spirit of God says to Brett don't eat that like I've already been through that this morning with donuts I mean because be, people that's what we do to people here we tempt them with donuts to see if the spirits at work in their life you know and uh, so I'm like don't eat the donuts they're bad for you Honestly, they are, but they, they're good to taste. But so the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Laziness is another weakness. As you know, they did a study uh, that, that says the natural tendency of human beings, this is just out last week, is to be lazy. 
All of us, I mean, given the choice, do you want to get up and help somebody or do you want to stay on the couch and watch TV and just do nothing? I think doing nothing wins. Netflix is just feeds that laziness, right? I mean, like, what do you want to do? Well, let's just sit around and chill and then and, 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 and we do this. All this and so the Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. Depression, anger, drama. Some of you, drama follows you around and you have no idea why. I don't know why drama just follows me everywhere. It's because... You're a drama person. <laughs> you just bring it out in people or you just panic the moment things just don't go your way. Maybe we, your weakness is relationships. You have a hard time getting along with people. It's like you're oil and the world is water and you just don't mix well with people. Or maybe you're like sandpaper and everybody else feels like you're just a little prickly. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. All of us have weaknesses so if you would just say this out loud with me I have weaknesses ready I have weaknesses the good thing is you're among friends did you hear that everybody has them but the spirit helps us and since God is helping us in our weaknesses how does he do it well he gives us his word his word is our reminder so when I don't know where to go I don't know what to do I don't just sit there and go well I guess I'll just stay put. You know, one of my weaknesses is laziness and I don't have much direction in life. I'm just going to stay here. No, what I do is when I feel weak in a particular area, I don't know the right direction, for instance, to take. I quote scripture back to God. I say it out of my mouth. The Lord is my shepherd. That's, that's just a little bitty scripture that I say out of my mouth. That is where the Spirit gets the Word of God out of my head, out of my mouth, into the air. Now, there's something about when you speak scripture to what you're facing internally, when you speak it out loud, I'm telling you, it changes the way you think. You ever tell a story that you thought, I think it's true, the more you tell it, the more it becomes true, right? <laughs> or if you've testified to God's blessing in your life, it becomes more real to you. That's why it is so important when God does something in your life that is good, tell somebody about it. Because not only are they blessed, you are blessed for getting it out of your mouth. And sometimes you are, the only thing that is keeping you from the problems in the future is because of the testimonies of what God has done in the past. Like that song we sang, sometimes, you know, you wonder, when are, when are the walls going to fall, God? You told us to surround these walls. The, the, the song we sang a minute ago is all about when the Israelites were surrounding Jericho and they were walking around the walls because God said to walk around the walls. It doesn't even make sense. The walls are supposed to fall. They're not falling. But they kept walking. And on the seventh day, God said, I want you to walk around seven times. And on the seventh day, on the seventh time, you're going to scream all at once. And so they did what they were told. For six days, they walked around a city and did nothing. On the seventh day, they walked around seven times. On the seventh time, they screamed, and then the walls fell. What the cool thing is, is God is at work on the daily basis when you don't want to be obedient, when you'd rather stay in bed but you come to church, when you'd rather just keep your kids home but you take them to youth anyway, you do the little things every single day and then on the, at the proper time, at just the, the fertile time, what you put in the ground, what you believe for begins to spring up. And a lot of things in life are just all about sowing seeds. We're sowing seed when we're planting family church here in town. We're sowing a seed. We're planting a baby church because God demands it in his word that we go and make disciples. We believe God's word is true. We don't know how it's all going to work out, but we do know that one thing that we could do wrong is to not do anything. So we plant and we believe that we are being faithful to sow good seed into the soil of God's heart, which is that all men may come to repentance. And if that is true, churches are where it happens. And so Pastor Neil has said yes, and he's going on this adventure, and he's scared to death. The fear of every church planner, can I tell you from experience, is that nobody's going to come. Nobody's going to believe in me. Nobody's going to show up. I'm doing this for nothing. And the devil is going to pile on Neil. Would you be in prayer for him over the next three months? Not only that you might go, but 
God will send the right people with him and the wrong people will stay away because some people you don't want in the new church, right? They're like bad seed. You don't want bad seed next to good seed because the bad seed just makes everybody crazy. So we don't want that. But see, God is working behind the scenes. So when you speak faith, sometimes he'll bring something to mind. Sometimes somebody will will call you on the phone or, or text you out of the blue. God is always up to something. See, the Spirit himself, it says, intercedes for us through wordless groans. So somehow God is praying. He's praying through our prayers. And I don't even know what to pray most of the time because half the time I pray and I think, well, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Or do I need to wait? I don't know. And it's a blessing to know that the Spirit translates our prayers because honestly, you and I really don't know what's good for us or what God needs to happen in in the first place. But we, we pray and we think, God, this is what I need now. I'm gonna keep praying. But sometimes he will just say, keep walking. Keep walking around that wall. It's gonna fall. I promise you that. I promised you good, but you've got to keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And so God is at work in every situation and behind behind the scenes. But he also is going to bring good, secondly, out of every situation. Romans 8, 28 is often quoted. So I want you to read it out loud with me off the screen. Would you read it out loud? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works. Now, this is a very difficult scripture. I'm being honest with you. When things are going good in your life and you notice somebody who's having a rough time, it's easy for you to lob this scripture at them in hopes that it encourages them. Because it says... In all things, God works for the good. So cheer up. It's going to get better. And we do believe that. But sometimes this scripture, when you're in a tough place, can feel a little bit like salt in your wounds, right? Well, God, I would rather your scripture say this. And we know that in all things, God stops all the bad things from happening. That's the version that's the Brett Rickey version, right? I wish that God would stop all the bad things from happening. If he's a good God, why does he allow evil in the world, right? You've heard that one. You've thought that. And then you come upon the scripture. To cloud things even more, you may have heard it said that God is in control. Now, wait a minute. If God is in control, then why was I abused as a child? If God is in control, then he doesn't have a good handle on things. You see where it leads us? If we say God is in control, then we've just made God the author of evil. Now, there's real evil in the world, folks. God doesn't cause evil. He allows men and women with a free will to commit evil acts to harm people with guns and crowds, to abuse the children that they bore. I wish I could rewrite the Bible and say God stops all the bad things from happening, but he doesn't ever let me do that. But here's the encouragement you need to hear today. Some of you are so mad at God And all I can tell you is this scripture is true. In all things, God works. It doesn't mean he causes them, but he does cause good to come about from them. You say, well, how does God do that? I don't know how. But I do know the same God that creates bad out of good is the same God that spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. How did he do it? I don't know, but he did. How does he take the manure of my life, the crud that people did to me and said about me, how does he take the manure and the grossness of life that happens to every human being, how does he make something good? I don't know, but God can. So what I do is I sow my faith into that manure. I I put that seed of faith and say, God, I hate what they did. It's ruined a family or more 
But out of this, Lord, your word says, in all these things, you can bring something good, so I'm giving it up to you. I'm leaving my faith in the soil of your love, and I know that you are working behind the scenes to bring something good out of this mess. Only you, the God of creation, can do this, and I trust you. Sometimes that's all you get to, folks. You'll never understand why it happened. Asking why is the wrong question anyway. The only question that will work is what now? Because Jesus promised his disciples, the people closest to him, he said, guys, in this world you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world, all right? So there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of unfairness. But in all of that, God can work something good for those who love him. Not for everybody. See, that's one of the benefits of being in the family of God. For those outside the family of God, when bad things happen, bad things happen. Right? There's even bumper stickers. It's like, happens, right? Or you hear this platitude that's not Christian. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, there's idiots in the world, right? That's the reason. But God didn't do it. I just feel like I'm talking to somebody here today that has really been broken and they don't know what to do with it. I'm just here to tell you that God, in his sovereignty, in his power, in his corrective nature, in his will for justice, is going to bring something good out of your broken situation. Can I just encourage you with that today? He loves you. This is how he shows love to you. Whew, I'm getting blessed. Whew, number three. God loves me because he shaped me to become more like Jesus. He wants me to improve. Look at verse 29. Those who God foreknew, that's me and you as Christians, he also predestined. Or he predetermined that they would be conformed to the image of his son. You ever wonder what God's plan is for your life? God's plan may include you being a doctor or a lawyer or a trash man or a sound engineer or a teacher. That may be part of his plan, but his number one plan for your life is that you become like Jesus. That's what he predestined. That's what he predetermined would be best for you. When you bear the image of God to the world. That's why we were saved. God saved me to shape me to be more like Jesus. That's my new job. That's my new vocation. In fact, Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That's you, Christians, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Isn't that good news? You're a chosen people, a holy nation, God's special possession. So God shapes you and me to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. And lastly, he does that because he's on my side. Look at verse 31. He begins the crescendo of this chapter, which is so poetically written. He says, what then? Even though creation is broken, and groaning for more. Even though the Holy Spirit is, 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 just, is, is, is groaning within us for prayers through us, what then shall we say in response to these truths? And he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's what he's saying. There is no contest here. If you are with God, he is with you to a greater degree than anybody on this planet. Now, I'm a, I'm a sports fan. And some of you may have noticed that LeBron James, King James, has gone to the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers have been mired in mediocrity lately, but now they have hope because he is literally the savior of the city right now, I'm telling you. LeBron James was made for basketball. Six foot eight, 260 pounds, can run faster than anybody on the floor in his prime, could jump higher than anybody. And if you got in his way, he would just dunk over you and make a LeBron poster right there. He was made for basketball by Almighty God. He is so good in clutch situation. He just, he's a great baller. And so when he shows up, he instantly gives hope 
to the Lakers, who have been a struggling team for decades, even with Kobe Bryant. They stunk most of the time because Kobe and Shaq couldn't get along. That's another story, all right? See, the Los Angeles Lakers have hope because LeBron is on their side. Yeah, let me tell you, he's going to have a hard time with Golden State, with Houston and everything else. I'm just kind of talking outside. <laughs> but remember, when God is on your side, who am I talking about that's on your side? Remember what I said about God last week? I'm quoting Isaiah who said, he holds the world in his hands as if it's a grain of sand. That's a pretty big deal. And so when Paul is saying, he's on my side, let that sink in. If God asks me to do something new in my spirit, I know that's the voice of God, no matter the outcome, I can't fail. He's on my side. I'm on his side. If God shows me a new direction in life to take, if I go with him, I can't fail. If I will trust him with everything, my family, my career, my job, my whatever college to go to, he's with me in everything. And here's the truth. You got to know this because life offers security in money, in prestige, image, you name it. There's a lot of false securities, but there is no security in life without God in your life. There's no security outside of that. But when you're moving with God, you will never fail, regardless of what the scoreboard says, right? Because sometimes the greatest Christians who ever lived died without seeing what they hoped to see. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 is all about people like that. They never saw Jesus. They never saw the fulfillment of their dream, yet they put everything they had into that, believing that God was with them. You say, well, didn't they fail in their lifetime? No. When you say yes to God, your win is guaranteed. No matter the scoreboard, I'm telling you, because there's a different scoreboard in heaven. God is keeping track of who says yes to him. And you just kind of, you miss it when you don't. But when you say, yes, that is the win. If God is for you, who can be against you? Here's what Isaiah said about it. Look at the scripture. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will withhold, uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that good news? Y'all aren't getting as excited as I am. Let me see that. Let me say that again. I'm going to read it again and you're going to have to come with an amen or I'm going to keep reading. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God and I will strengthen you and help you. I will withhold, uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Amen. All right, got it. There we go. I knew you were with me. Y'all are a thinking bunch today. We're thinking about that. All right. So in response to stress, I remember God is working with me. So I'm stressed out. My head's on the pillow. I can't think of anything but the numbers that don't add up. I can't think of anything but the, the problem I'm dealing with, with at work, with people. They frustrate me. God, you're on my side. I'm going to rest very securely in that knowledge. There is no security outside of you. You see how this works? I mean, this is how my brain has to process stress in response to anxiety. I know that God is bringing good to me. In response to loneliness, I proclaim, God, you are on my side and you love me. I'm not going to take a shortcut to fill a hole that only you can fill. And since, since he's on my side, listen to the Apostle Paul sum it up in verse 35. He begins, he says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. In other words, all of the bad things that can happen in life. He's saying, I know Jesus loves me. <coughs> Even when I'm facing really bad stuff. Fast forward to verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I don't know what's happened in your life that makes you doubt God's love or 
If you came here today hurting from something going on in your home or from your past that won't let go, I'm here to tell you that God loves you.